Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Theology Talk, where we explore both our own theology in the restored Church of Jesus Christ and the theology of others. I'm your host, Jacob Hansen, and joining me today is my co-host, Hayden Carroll. Hey, everyone. Thanks for being here. And we today are actually continuing a conversation with our special guest, Blake Osler. Blake, thanks for continuing on this conversation with us. Delighted to do so. So uh, for those who may not know, Blake is a author of Exploring Mormon Thought, a four-volume series on that. I've actually had him on previously to talk about some of those series, so you guys can check those out. Um, theologian and just a honestly a, a really cool guy and a fun guy to talk to. So again, that's, thanks, that's Blake. That's right away here. <laughs> All righty. So Hayden, uh, so so in today, what I what we want to do is we want to actually talk a little bit about the issue of God's foreknowledge, and and so Hayden and I have talked about this idea, and I find myself somewhere in between it, um, with the nature of God's foreknowledge and sort of what is termed as open theism, um, where the 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 future isn't necessarily determined. Um, and anyway, I'm sort of in the middle and I want to have a conversation between Blake and Hayden so that Hayden can kind of pose some of the questions that he has about, uh, Blake's view and Blake, I want you to also feel free to probe Hayden and ask him questions that maybe are hard for him to answer because what I want to do is just compare and contrast these different views because amongst members of the church, you will find that people have divergent views on this subject. And just as a disclaimer to anyone watching this in general, when we're talking about theology within the church, there are certain kind of doctrines that we generally all agree on that are very clearly revealed and that we understand very well. Oftentimes in theology, we're trying to basically use the power of reason to explore topics with our own minds, trying to sort through it and figure it out. I always tell people, allow your theology to be a work in progress because none of us have it figured out perfectly. And these things should be sort of interesting and fun to explore. But at the end of the day, um, they are not uh, the most fundamental thing, which is the the spiritual experience with God that acts at the root of our testimony. So I always want to throw that out because in this episode, we might have different points of view. And I don't want people thinking that, uh, that that's not allowed in the church. Jared, can I say one thing about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. So just to give the listeners, whether you're, you're LDS, especially if you're not LDS, just to make a little more uh, or, or give my second witness to what Jacob's saying, consider the core doctrines if you are LDS. And if you're not, consider these core doctrines that when you get into the mud of them, there's a there's possibilities of, of disagreement, like he's saying. So I'm going to give some examples. We would say like the Godhead, right? All three of us believe there is a Godhead. We believe there's God the Father, Jesus Christ is his son, and was the ultimate sacrifice for sin. We believe in the Holy Ghost as the comforter and the testifier, right? We believe in the plan of salvation. We believe that uh, the priesthood has been restored, that Just Smith is a prophet. There are these core foundational, we'll say, truths. And when you dig a little bit deeper and try to understand what's under the hood, that maybe is where we differ. Is that is that a fair way to say it, yeah. you guys? Yeah, would absolutely. And I would I would I would second that just with the and that's the same for any tradition. <laughs> any any you dig deep enough into it, and every single individual has probably some theological views that differ from from other people. And so no no faith tradition has perfect. Uh, unanimity here. Blake, any, any thoughts on that before we roll into it? I'd say it's a very good thing and uh, shows that, it, you know, it's healthy for people to, as we think about this, come to differing conclusions and, and then share with each other the reasons and, and disputations that we have regarding the different views. And by disputation, what I mean is we're simply saying, well, I've, I've got a reason. Let me, let me present those reasons and, and see how you respond to those reasons. That kind of yeah, absolutely. So, can, can I say one more thing, Jacob? Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if we need this, qual this qualifier. Sometimes when I watch videos and I'm not familiar with the individuals in the video, sometimes I'm left guessing on what their beliefs actually are. Can we just clarify? All three of us are, are active Latter-day Saints, right? We hold Pre President Nelson 
as the as the key holder, right? We support the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency. Just and I, I say that because sometimes when I watch videos, I'm not sure if I'm working with a fundamentalist. I'm not sure if I'm working, you know, with Community <laughs> of Christ. So just you know, just to be clear, that's what we're dealing with uh, in regards to our core belief, anyway. Yeah, I think we're all pretty standard Latter Day Saints who go to church on Sunday, and I think we're a good representation of Latter Day Saints who go to church every Sunday but still have some differing ideas about our theology, which is probably very common. No, just look at us. We're triplets. <laughs> almost, almost. All right, so we'll, let's get started. We'll, we'll jump in with, uh, with you first, Hayden, actually. Um, and I want you to lay out your understanding of the question of, um, does God know perfectly the future? Does he know okay. exactly what's going to happen in the future? Sure. My position is really simple. God knows the future and he knows exactly what you're going to do, where you're going to end up. And because even though he does, and this is what we're going to talk about, that does not conflict with your agency. I'd say it's the most standard acceptance of God's foreknowledge in the church today is that people okay. would accept that he He knows the future and there we'll talk about it. Um, but that doesn't destroy our agency or that doesn't constitute pre, uh, you know, determinism or predestination as maybe a Calvinist would say. it. Okay. And, uh, Blake, I'll let you kind of take that on. And, and I, I want, I, I don't want this to necessarily be like a debate, but obviously there may be differences in ideas here. And I think that it would be, uh, again, Hayden, I know that that's what you think, but I, I assume you like me, we're open-minded to being convinced otherwise, if there's a better argument. So sure. Blake, go ahead. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on, on kind of Hayden's position? Um, I agree with him. I think it's kind of the default position um, of the of the church and believers. <laughs> um, I I don't believe that many of the Latter Day prophets held that position, and that they were explicit about that. But um, I I think there are two primary issues. One is how does God know the future, and does it conflict with agency? Uh, let me. There are different views about how God knows the future. One is that he sees the future. This is the most common view. It's kind of the default view as well. But if God knows the future because he sees it, then neither is God free, nor are we. Nor are we. Take an example. You've got a, a woman, and she's got a choice between two suitors to marry, Smith and Brown. And she wants to know which one, and so she prays to God and says, you know, I think I like Smith better, and I would prefer to marry Smith. And what should I do? And God says, well, I've seen that you're going to marry Brown, and you're going to be miserable. It's just a whole day. What do you mean I'm going to marry Brown and be miserable? I'm not, if I'm going to be miserable, I'm not going to marry him. And God says, well, sorry. I've seen that that's the way it's going to be. It's not going to be other than I've seen it. <laughs> and she says, well, I, I mean, that how, how could that possibly be? And what would it be like if I married Brown? He says, I don't know. I haven't seen that. I've seen that you, you or, or, or I, I, what would it be like if I married Smith? Don't know. I haven't seen that. I've so seen the idea, so, so <laughs> to, to, to sum up that example, the, the, the point of it here, and I'm going to play kind of moderator to, to make sure that things are clear. What you're saying is essentially that if God reveals to us what's going to happen in the future and it can't be otherwise, that sort of is like, well, then I guess I don't have choice in the matter in that subject. Is that sort of the idea there? Yeah, so I think. Yes, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, uh, Blake. I, I don't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead, Blake. Go ahead. I wanted you to do that. This notion of simple foreknowledge, okay? Simple foreknowledge is that God knows one simple future, and he knows it through vision, if you will. He's seen it. There's another view, which is middle knowledge, and that is that God knows not merely what the future will be, he knows all he knows all the alternatives. He knows that if he creates possible world A, that in A, Smith will accept Christ and be saved. If he creates possible world B, he's going to reject Christ. Okay. And so he chooses which one to create and, and the world falls out. But middle knowledge simply means that God knows he can answer the question, you know, George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. God shows George Bailey what his life would have been like if he had never, or, or what the world would be like if he'd never been born. Well, that's a world that didn't actually occur. So how does God know that? Not by seeing it because it never happened. 
So God intuits it, according to those who adopt this view. There's also a view of eternal knowledge. By eternal, I mean timelessly eternal knowledge. God is in, any, in, a, in a durationless eternal now, and he looks down and sees all moments of time, and they're all present to him. And so you have these different models of how God sees things. And, for instance, Thomas Aquinas seems to have equivocated. There, there are a lot of reasons why Thomas Aquinas couldn't say that God sees the future by seeing it or knows the future by seeing it. Instead, God knows the future because he causes it to be what it is. Um, but Thomas Aquinas was also a libertarian and said that uh, free will is incompatible with causation. So he starts screwing with the notion of causation that distinguishes God's causation from other types of causation and so forth. Let's, let, let's let's real quick go to Hayden. I want to I want to get his thoughts on on some of the stuff that we talked about. My uh, I, I think I would subscribe to what you've called eternal knowledge. Is that what you called it? Timeless. Where, timeless. Uh, timeless. Yeah. Where where he can, I would say he can see right now, whatever the word now means to him. I guess in our time, the day I was born, he can see us talking here, and he can see the day that I'm exalted or whatever kingdom I'm going to go to. Right. Um, that's what I would subscribe to. So I want to I want to just make one comment on simple foreknowledge. I think is what you called it, and that's with Smith and Brown, right? That's simple foreknowledge. Yeah. I think and just to, just for the listeners, so they can make sense of this uh, even more, is to say that if he were to tell her that he, that she was going to be miserable when she married Brown, and then she were to say, "Okay, well then I'm going to marry Smith," then that would make God either a liar or it would make him wrong. Is that right? That's one of the major issues with, with simple right. form. He can't be wrong. And if he's seen what's going to occur, nothing could be more certain than the me. If I've seen something that's that hasn't occurred yet, but I've seen it has to cause me to have the sight that I have. And so it already exists in the sense that it can cause me to see it. And nothing is more clear than the entailment that a person that, that what God sees can't be otherwise. If it can't be otherwise, then we're not free because freedom is the power to do otherwise. Is it possible though that because what if what if God knew what was going to happen, but he just didn't tell her? Yeah, this that whether there's a distinction between the problem of prophecy and simply the problem of foreknowledge. And there could be because the problem of prophecy adds what I would call a particular hard fact to the past. But I contend that there's not really a distinction. This is the argument as to why foreknowledge is not compatible with free will. If God knew in 1900 that tomorrow I'm going to mow my lawn, and for me to have power not to mow my lawn tomorrow, I would have to have power to change the past. In fact, I'd have to have the power to change the most settled past fact possible because it's known by an immutable, perfect being who can't be wrong. <laughs> okay, let me let me just, just uh, tap the brakes and make sure I get a kind of a clarification on that because I think that's an important point. What you're saying is, is that if you were to choose otherwise to mow your lawn, and God knew that in 1900, that would change. It would have to change what he did in the past in order to, to like, in order for you to be able to choose differently, you would have to be able to change the past of what he saw. Exactly. But let me point out that Hayden throws a wrinkle in that view. And that is that God doesn't exist in the past. He exists in the eternal now in which yeah, and, the past and, was, right? And so, and so let me, let me real quickly kind of chime in on that. That for me has always been the most appealing one. The pro it, in my mind, it sort of, in a way, at least my take on it, and I could be wrong here, is the way I see it is if God exists outside of time, the I, I really found the, the example, I think C.S. Lewis made it, God exists in relation to us as we exist in relationship to like a novel, like Lord of the Rings. To us, every part of that book is present, all of it. But to the character in the story, it is an unfolding over time of their timeline. And so for God, it is this eternally now sort of thing that we that we can't comprehend either. There's sort of an appeal to this is something that just is beyond uh, you because we we can't understand it within temporality. And I'm going to let Hayden go and then I'll let you jump on that, Blake. I was just going to say I will concede that, that part of my view does... Um, it, it, what's the word I'm looking for? It uses kind of what you just said. Ultimately, I would have to conclude that there's some sort of reality of time 
or God viewing time that we can't understand. So I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, I know exactly how it works. Um, and, and maybe it's a, a moot point because of that. Um, I don't know. Is there, any, is there anything else that you were thinking about, well, Blake? Let me, let me let me pull Blake up on this. So so are we are we are we just losers that are appealing to ignorance here and to and appealing to mystery to avoid the problem? Is that what we're doing? Or well, you, you can do that, but it's not going to avoid the problem. First, the analogy is a terrible one. There isn't really a character in the book. That's fiction. You got that right. And as you read the book, it's not all before you at once. You're reading through the book and finding out how the book unfolds. After you've read the book in the past then the past exists and it's already concluded. And you can't change what's in the book. You're not free and nobody in the book is free. So if you want to give me an example of how this could relate to a free person, you're giving me a terrible example because there's not a free being involved in the entire, in the entire analogy. And so, so I guess, I guess to a certain extent, I, I see what you're saying there where you're saying that a book is determined. Like the book's already been written. What the character is going to do is already done. Like they can't, the, the, the character in the book isn't free to change the, the words. It just is a static thing. So it's just a poor example. Yeah. Moreover, the very idea of, of timeless eternity is fraught with incredible problems. I treat these in one of the chapters of my book. I even bring in the theory of relativity to play with and compare and contrast and various notions of time that have been held by various philosophers. Let's, let's talk about a particularly Mormon notion of God. God has a body, right? Yes, so, that, that, has, that would be that would be our doctrine. I, but we would we would also say though that he is a it is a body that is glorified in some way that we don't fully understand. We can say that, but a glorified body has arms and legs, right? Yeah. So I hold up my hands, and I ask how long it takes to travel between the two hands. There's still time involved. And if I have a body, inherently I have the notion of time because bodies are in space and the notions of space and time are inherently interwoven. So it's not possible that God exists in a timeless now if he's a body. Is it possible, though, that he exists in time, but there's some sort of knowledge or spiritual enlightenment or light or glory that allows him to move beyond that, even though he is in time? I mean, God is kind of like a mathematical equation that, is timeless, even though we figure it out in time. So he's this kind of ideal reality that doesn't change and doesn't have a mind. And well, just, well, maybe it's not a far stretch. If you're saying he has existed forever as he is, we don't really understand that, right? And this is from our previous episode. I'm not going to say that I can comprehend eternity past, but I will say that God became human at some point. And you can't have a timeless deity who changes like that. If you're timeless, there's not a before and after. It's what the night of timelessness entails. But there was a time before which each of the divine persons was human. There was a time after which they became human, the father and the son, and a time after which they died and resurrected. And, you know, God can't do any of the things he said to the scripture. He can't plan because a plan means something hasn't occurred yet and you're planning for it to occur. He can't remember because that, that means that you're remembering something that happened in the past. <laughs> the kind of things God can't create. Creation and causation are inherently temporal notions. There was a before creation and after creation. What's God's relation to his act of creation? Now, I don't I don't want to pretend that there aren't brilliant theologians who haven't dealt with these questions at great length, okay? People much more intelligent than I am. But I don't believe any of their arguments succeed. I think that the notion of timelessness, etern timeless eternity, and timelessness are incoherent. And they're especially incoherent in the Mormon worldview. The notion that God has a body cannot be squared with a, a timeless deity. If you how want, about, how yeah. about the how about the um, the no? Well, I know another one of our notions that's extremely important is the idea of agency, and not only agency now, but kind of eternal notions of agency. And if we're going to have the ability to choose that seems to, I guess I'll kind of open it up to you, Blake. What does that entail for this argument of, of, of timelessness? Yeah. And I, I've acknowledged that Hayden throws and the idea of divine timelessness throws kind of a wrench in the argument of the incompatibility between free will and foreknowledge because the incompatibility arises from the notion of past necessity. I can't change the past. 
And if God knew something in the past, I don't have power to change the fact that he knew it. And if I don't have that power, I'm not free. But if God's outside of time, we could say, oh, well, he didn't know anything in the past. The problem is, is that if God is timeless, he is immutable and unchangeable in the strongest sense possible because there can't be any distinction between his states of being. And a being that is immutable and can't have a different belief than he actually has, we're not free to do anything different than the belief he actually has. And so the fact is, we're not free. Timelessness doesn't solve the problem because of the, what's entailed by the idea of timelessness for the divine attributes and knowledge. <clears throat> not, not to mention the fact that just how a timeless being could be acted upon by thing, events occurring in time. <clears throat> Remember, for Thomas Aquinas to solve this problem, in order for God to know what happens in time, he had to say that God knows because his knowledge extends as far as his causation. God knows what happens in time because he's causing it to happen. But yeah, which, what would you do, agree with him on that, that foreknowledge is, is causation, is equal to causation? Well, in Thomas's view, it is. For, for you, though, would you agree with that? Or? Yeah, for Thomas Aquinas, it is. And, and for a number of, of classical theologians, not all classical theologians hold that. But view. not you. You you don't hold that view. Definitely. I'm not a classical theologian. <laughs> yeah. No, that's what I was about to say. That's what I'm saying. You don't believe in in absolute foreknowledge, but if you did, oh, let me fix my camera quick. If you did believe in uh, in absolute foreknowledge, would you agree that it would be ca it would be causational to the well, future? Be a counterfactual question that I don't think has meaning. Okay. You know, can you, can you un un unwrap that for us for a second? Yeah. The notion of, of if God, had, if I believe something I don't believe, would I also believe, how would I solve the problem, right? But since I don't hold that belief, I have no need to solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> there, isn't no high, there is no way to solve that problem. That's why he doesn't believe it. So, yeah. so, so, so real quick. So let, let's go to that then, because the, the, there's sort of this idea of um, um, omniscience, uh, to perfect knowledge, right? And within the classical theistic world, that means God knows everything, including the future and what is going to happen. That's the general consensus. Um, and we come in here and are we actually saying that God doesn't have a perfect knowledge of the future because the future has not been written yet? So no. does that mean that his promises could potentially not come to pass? No. No. <clears throat> because God fulfills his promises through his divine power rather than his divine knowledge. There's a scripture in Second Nephi where he says he has power to bring about all the occurrence of all of his words, essentially. So, so he so so but you were just saying that he doesn't cause things to happen. So so you're saying here though that that God God will make the end results be what they need to be. You'll notice that when prophecies are made in the Old Testament about what people are going to freely do, there's always a conditional clause, if. And sometimes what's predicted doesn't even occur. <laughs> there was a prediction about what Jonah would do, and Jonah didn't do it. <laughs> so are, there, are, there any, um, are there any exceptions to that rule in regards to if you do this, this will happen? That, that you know of. And, and I, I have a couple of scriptures that maybe we could read and I kind of get your. Sure. I think the toughest scripture from, from my position is how did, how did Jesus predict that Judah, that Judas would betray him? And my response is he didn't have to predict anything. Jesus, Judas had already betrayed him. The second most difficult is where Christ says before the cock crows thrice, but before the rooster uh, crows three times, you're going to deny me. Right? Could you could you say that that was just a really good prediction? Like he's, it's like Jesus is the greatest weatherman on earth, but he's he'll he'll get it right ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time. No, I would say that it wasn't a prediction at all. It was a command. <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that that theory That's as well. Position. What he was telling him is, when rather than give up your life. When they ask if you know me, deny me, because otherwise they're going to kill you. Yeah, I've heard that as well, because people are like, why would Peter deny him if Peter was the most dedicated of all and was the one who was like, let him kill me, I don't care. And he's saying, no, deny me. Yeah, Christ is saying, Peter, you've got to survive. Well, well, well real quick, but but back kind of to the topic at hand, what, so, so in my mind, it's a, it's a dichotomy. 
Okay. It is either God knows a hundred percent what's going to happen in the future or he does not. And you're saying that he knows what's going to happen, but not because those things are predetermined, but because he is going to bring them about through his power. If he makes a prophecy, not everything he knows does he bring about through his power. And it's a false dichotomy that you just raised. Okay. It's all that exists. And he knows the present probability of everything that will occur. Probabilities change over time. But it, so, for instance, if you've got incurable cancer, God knows the, the probability that you're going to die within the next two weeks is 100%. <clears throat> he knows those kind of things because they're the outflow of existing causes. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up question there? What? Uh, well, actually, let me, let me read a scripture and tell me what you think about it. This is from the Book of Mormon. This may, may put it to the test. This is Nephi, and he says, And when these things have passed away... Uh, and when these things have passed away, a speedy destruction cometh unto my people, the Nephites. For notwithstanding the pains of my soul, I have seen it. Wherefore, I know that it shall come to pass. They shall sell themselves for naught, and shall reward their pride with their foolishness, and shall reap destruction. For behold, they yield unto the devil, and choose works of darkness rather than light. Therefore, they must go down to hell. So what's your take on Nephi claiming that he's seen the future of his people, which won't happen for another thousand years? Right. So in future visions of the world, what God is actually showing is his plan for the people so that he can see the plan. And the plan was that the Lamanites would. Interesting. You, you think God planned for the Nephites to fall? Yeah, he also planned to send a savior when we sinned. So I think he planned for sinners. <laughs> so when you say planned, you don't mean determined. Right. I don't mean determined at all. Because they had choice. They still had choice. So could the Nephites have chosen not to? become prideful? Yeah, I mean, we have all kinds of uh, prophecies. For instance, <clears throat> um, Jonah testifies that Nineveh will fall. And and it doesn't. Something strange happens. Nineveh repents and it doesn't fall, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so Jonah is really upset with God because he, he even says he's upset with God because he gave a word of prophecy and it didn't come about as he prophesied. And so, yeah, sometimes prophetic words... And, and I could give all kinds of instances of failed prophecies where prophecies were made and they did come to pass. Interesting. So Jeremiah says there's always an if in all prophecies. There's a condition. And so all prophecies are conditional. I, I have an article that I have written about this, <coughs> about the conditional nature of all prophecy. Where can the listeners find that just in case people want to dig more into this? Because I'd like to read it. Well, it, it's in the Journal for the Philosophy of, of the, the Mormon Society of Theology and Philosophy, the very last issue of it. Um, I also discuss all of these issues in my first volume at, at great length. And oh, okay. I have these prophecies as well. But I, I give particular attention to the hermeneutic of the biblical text in this article. And I show the difference between the way open theists interpret text and the way the classical theists interpret text. So let me, let me unpackage a few things there. He's talking about her hermeneutics. This is a theory of interpretation, a way of interpreting the scriptures, and then talking about open theists like yourself. So an open theist, my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is someone who believes that the future is not set in stone. Right. And that, that it, the future is still open. That's an open theist versus someone who would be maybe a process theist, I believe is what it's called. Process theists are a type of open theist because they believe the future hasn't yet been created, doesn't yet exist, and so there's nothing there to know. And I that's see. the position I would take. Um, and I probably have something in common with many process theists, but I, I don't consider myself a full-blooded process theist. A process theist is somebody who believes that becoming is the essence of, of existence and creativity is the essence of existence. And that God can't fully control that creativity. That he, I see. he'll guide it, but he can't control so it. So process theism is part of open theism. It's a type of open theism. Is that what you're saying? It's a type of open theism. There are also evangelicals who are open theists who affirm creation ex nihilo or creation out of nothing. I don't affirm that. Yeah. I reject that. And I, I actually argue in my second volume that creation out of nothing is also inconsistent with free will. Um, yeah. And, and so, I, I've, I found that super compelling and that, so, so there's, but what's the opposite of open theism then just, just kind of for reference. Well, the opposite of open theism is what you're espousing, what, what Hayden is espousing. God knows fully the future. 
and it doesn't conflict with free will. That was Calvin's position. But Calvin was also Uh-oh. A- Hayden Hayden's fallen under John Calvin. That's that's a <laughs> Hayden's going to have some explaining to do if he finds out he's on the same page as John Calvin. <laughs> Calvin that every that, that God causally determines everything that happens. Okay? Hayden's not going to affirm that. <laughs> right? No. And you're and so I'm going to ask you if if it's not causally determined and it hasn't yet happened, how does God know it? Well, again, I would appeal to this idea that there's something about time that we don't understand, right? Because I think is it fair to say that you are assuming that God is on the same timeline as us? No, I okay. I, I what's known as omnitemporality in this in the theory of relativity. The, the 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 now for an, an observer in a particular inertial frame of reference can be different for different observers depending on which inertial frame of reference they're in. God exists in all inertial frames of reference. We exist in only one as we are now. And so God has a complete knowledge of all inertial frames of reference. We do not. And so the, our relation to time is different than God's. Um, on the other hand, God is still, there's still a temporality. There's still a before and after. The notion of causation still makes sense. Causation is apparently a temporal notion. Um, and so I'm not affirming timelessness. I'm, I'm affirming that God bears a different relationship to time than we do. So, okay. so, and that, that seems pretty consistent with, with our kind of scriptures on that, that for God, time still exists. It just exists in some sort of a different sense than it exists for us, but right. it still exists because, and I can see what you're saying there. You know, it's like, there's a lot of things that break down when you say that there is no time, such as causality. I mean, really all of reality just kind of, you can't make any sense of it because time just is so baked into the reality that we experience. It's like saying God sees a lightning bolt. Well, the essence of the lightning bolt is the change. It is in the cloud. It issues from the cloud, hits the ground. In the timeless eternity, what does God see? He sees the moment it's in the cloud, sees it issuing from the cloud, he sees it hitting the ground. But how do you understand the notion of what it is for a lightning bolt to strike? Because none of those are a lightning bolt strike unless you put them all together. So for God to know certain things, it can't simply be timeless knowledge. Um, and timeless eternity runs into problems any time that it interacts with the dynamic world that we live in, right? So um, how could you hold a dialogue with God where he knows everything you're going to say before you say it? It's not a genuine dialogue. I, I have a, an argument about that as well in my book. That it's just, That would just be a facade. Haven't you seen Bruce Almighty, though? I mean, it's obviously possible. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I have seen Bruce Almighty, and I find the view of God there to be compelling, and so I, I, I concede. <laughs> I, I have a question. I'm going to appeal to authority for a second. Well, I, I, I here's my first question, and I actually wrote it down so I would, I would articulate it in the way I planned. Here's my question. Would an official, uh, Blake, for you, would an official declaration from the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve stating that God has ultimate true foreknowledge as I have, have presented, would that persuade you in any way to agree with them? Or does any level of priesthood authority key holding, you know, declaration of truth? And you may say, well, they would never do that because it's not true. But what do you would, think? I would give some weight to that, but I would take scripture over that. I would take Joseph Smith's statements over that. Maybe in third place, official statements. And then I would remind people about the official statement of the first presidency where they justified blacks not having the priesthood. That was based upon, you know, a Protestant reading of scripture that has no basis. Does that destroy all uh, but, official, you know, announcements of the first presidency then? No, what it does is it puts it into proper perspective. These are not scripture for a reason. They haven't been accepted by common consent. They're not binding upon me, mm. but they're, they're the thinking of the United Brethren, so I give it weight. In forming, so I have kind of this hermeneutic principle of how we form our belief system, and one is you, you can't you can't just take everything and say everything is true because it's easy to show that there are conflicts, right? And so how do you determine which of those you're going to accept? I can show scriptures that assume foreknowledge. I can show scriptures that definitely assume that God doesn't have foreknowledge, Okay. And so what do we do when we have that kind of disunity? Um, 
and, and we had an express disagreement. Brigham Young and Wilfred Woodruff and Lorenzo Snow all taught that God is progressing in knowledge. And there are things that he doesn't know and that he, his knowledge unfolds. Um, I, I think it's fairly clear that Joseph Fielding Smith didn't believe that. He believed like you do. Okay. And Harold B. Lee believed like you do. I think that's demonstrable. And so we have this kind of disagreement among the prophets of this dispensation. And where we have that dis, that kind of disagreement, it's like we say, um, agreement in essentials, an open mind with respect to disagreement on other issues, <laughs> right? Yeah, and that's that's very much where where I fall on a lot of this is, you know, this is something that I'm still trying to sort out myself, but I can see where you're coming from, Blake, with if we believe in a in a God that exists in some sort of a temporal body of any kind that's causing things to happen in, in our world to say that, and, and even within the scriptures itself, like it doesn't say necessarily within the scriptures and maybe Hayden, you can challenge me on this, but within the scriptures, I don't know that it says that God does not exist in any kind of time, but just that time is different, that there's some sort of a, a different temporality there. But, but I want to, I want to hit on this agency issue because my, take on it, and Blake, you can correct me if I'm misrepresenting you here, is that agency is simply logically incompatible with divine foreknowledge. Yeah, because and in a time of you don't really believe in foreknowledge, you just believe in divine timeless knowledge. They're different. There is no before if you believe God is timeless. So I, I want to make the distinction between those two and be careful to distinguish them because what Hayden is expressing is not really foreknowledge at all. So all those scriptures, Hayden, that say that God has foreknowledge, just throw those out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to present it to you and just kind of understand how you would interpret them. Well, the, the Greek word that is prognosko doesn't really mean foreknowledge in the sense it, it really means prognostication which is very different. So God is prognosticating how things will be. He can tell us exactly what his plan is. in every Prognostication. Way. You want to define that term real quick for the audience? Yeah, I'm prognosticating. If I give a prognosis on a disease, same word, mm -hmm. then I'm not telling you exactly how it's going to go. I'm going to tell you how things probably will be. It's a prediction of the future based on probability. Yeah, I'm a doctor. I know all of these kinds of problems. I've practiced for 400 years, and I've got a really good database to draw from. So would, you say that, would we say that God is the greatest, you know, predictor of what our behavior will most likely be, but there is still a chance that it won't be like a really good weatherman? Well, yeah, God, God certainly knows more about all of us, probably even than we could possibly remember about ourselves, right? But we can always act out of character. The idea of prediction based upon who we've been assumes that there's no such thing as repentance no such thing as a new person created through um, being born again, and that our past is a perfect predictor of our future. The entirety of Christianity is against that view. Well, I would I would look at it and say, this is where I come down to is, if God is the greatest predictor, right? The way you predict things is based on, like, if you're going to predict what I'm going to do, it's based on my character. And so my character would determine my future behavior. And God knows my character so well, he knows what I'm going to do. But that would say that that something in me is uh, is determining what I do rather than me. Is that, I mean... Yeah, let's say you have a fallen character. The whole point of Christianity is that you're not stuck with it, okay? And character is not causative. You just use a word that really doesn't refer to anything except for all of your past choices. And there is no such thing as a reify, reification is the idea of taking something abstract and making it concrete. Character is doing that. It, it is a logical mistake is what I'm saying. And so the notion, however, that I could predict everything that I'm going to do based upon my past discounts the notion that I can change. I can become a different person than I was. You could not predict what Ebenezer Scrooge was going to do based upon what happened before the night of the visitation of the spirits. But what if, what if, unless you've already seen the play? Well, then there's no then free you're outside of time. Oh, yeah, good. Well, but would my, but that's looking backwards though. So they made the choice, right? If we're looking backwards, we run into the problem of past necessity. You can't change the past, it's beyond your power. 
So right. let's, let's hit that one again, because that seems to be the the fatal kind of stroke on your view of a timeless sort of <clears throat> deity is that you can't change the past. So go ahead and explain explain that one more time. Let's let's break that one down again. This is actually with other forms of foreknowledge, not timeless knowledge. If God knows at a specific time in the past or all past times that I am going to do a certain act, I'm going to mow my lawn tomorrow. I do not have it in my power to change the past fact that God knew that it's beyond. Otherwise, he'd be wrong in the past. Yeah, so I don't have the power, alternative power, to do something different than what God knows I'm going to do because, based upon past necessity, there's no reality that is consistent with His knowledge other than that particular reality. There's no other possible reality. Okay. I see. Now, now let's go to timeless knowledge. So, or timeless. If God is outside of time, it just creates all the are they ontological problems that we'd put it like the, just the problems with, with the nature of God just makes no sense. Everything becomes rendered incoherent. Well, there are two problems. One is that the nature of God and especially God being embodied or, or interacting with a, a dynamic temporal framework like ours is incoherent. I, you know, there are a lot of arguments. There are a lot of arguments on both sides. I go through them in my book, but the pro there's still a problem specifically with God's knowing what we're going to do and being free. If God is timeless, there's a single instant in time, okay? It's durationless. And what God knows can't change because there's no state of affairs um, that could possibly be different than what God's knowledge would be in that particular instant. You can't change that. It's not within our power to do so. It is what it is. It's simply given, and it's a given fact about us. From my perspective, Obviously, and I've, I've never been able to make sense of, well, I exist in time, God's outside of time. But from my perspective, it hasn't happened yet. From God's perspective, it's happening right now. God's watching me do it. So in the same moment that that, that Rome is burning and, and Nero is fiddling, the astronauts are walking on the moon from Apollo 11. Yeah. By the simple property of transitivity, if, if God sees consi consistent with his time that Nero is fiddling, and also in the same moment that the astronauts are walking on the moon, it follows that in the same moment the astronauts are walking on the moon while Nero is fiddling in Rome. It's incoherent. One is going to have to come up with a lot of, of very difficult arguments to get out of that simple recognition. It just doesn't register within the domain of rational, coherent thought. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, I mean, most people, I think, would say just even grasping what a timeless eternity could possibly be is well beyond our comprehension. And so, you know, what you do is you throw your arms up and say, well, God's greater than we are. He knows better. Well, and maybe, and maybe Hayden, I mean, if, if ultimately, I mean, if we're doing theology, like we should to some extent on the show, the idea is more to focus on rationally justifying particular ideas that we hold rather than simply saying, well, so-and-so said it, therefore it's true. Well, if you kind of hear what I've been saying this whole time, I think on a philosophical level and a rational level, if you will, I think I would agree with him. My issue is, and, and maybe I'm, it's the issue of authority. Of no, and that, and that, that makes sense. I'm, I don't want to discount authority like it doesn't matter. I'm just yeah. saying that if, if you're going to go on the philosophical route that's and, and, the, and, and rational route, and then we can appeal to authority and say, well, maybe we need to think harder about this because it doesn't Probably. line up with authority yeah. for one reason or another. I don't know. Would you, well, let me ask Blake, what do you think? And, and actually I wrote this question down, so I would say it correctly again, even if you don't agree with it, what do you believe is the strongest argument against your stance on God's foreknowledge? I gave them to you. The, the particular prophecies where. Right. Okay. And that's what I would as well. And the, the second is the argument that you've made. It, it would be the argument from authority. Okay. You know, I would respond that the authorities are not consistent on this issue. Mm. I would. And, there are a lot of kinds of scriptural indications that God remembers and plans and forgives. You can't forgive if, if you're timeless either. And he answers prayers. He enters into dialogue. I could give you a, a, a list really, really long of things that God has said to do in scriptures that assume that God is not timeless in the sense that, that you're you're suggesting he has so, so uh, yeah it's not univocal no, that's okay no that's good um so help me understand going back to prophecy for a second are you saying that god plans for people 
to fall away from him. And help me understand the difference between someone planning for someone to fall away, especially before they're born, versus, you know, knowing that they're going to fall away versus determining that they're going to fall away. Um, it's easy because there's a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and so forth. <laughs> okay. And God looks at all the possibilities. So he's like a master chess player. So I'm playing chess with a novice. Let's assume I'm a master chess player. I know the moves that the, master, that the novice is making, and I've got so much experience, I can beat him every single time. Let's say that you're playing God. He knows so well that he can beat every single game of chess, and he doesn't know exactly what moves you're going to make, but he doesn't need to know that in order to, to win the game every single time because he has a strategy for whatever move you make. Mm. I would say that God has a strategy for whatever choices we make. One of the choices that was possible that God prepared for was if we sin, there will be a savior. Okay. So that was plan, you know, probably plan A. Plan B was if we sin and there's a savior, but we don't accept the savior, there's a plan C. Well, we'll wait till you're dead and we'll preach the gospel to you then and see if you'll accept it. Okay. And it. so I, I see the Bible um, in particular, and and you know, even God had a plan B for the Book of Mormon when the plates disappeared, you know, or the the hundred sixteen pages disappeared. God had a plan B. But well, and for, and and for me, that's sort of one of those things that I feel like within it, it creates some real puzzles where things happen that it's almost like, well, God could have just seen that coming. Like I thought He knew everything. Like why didn't He? And, and I think that the the strict view that he has perfect foreknowledge as in he knows exactly what pieces you're going to move on the table actually creates a lot of problems to where it becomes very, very difficult to see, well, why didn't God just, you know, if he could have seen this coming, why didn't he make different moves than he did? Where, and if I, if I understand you right, you're saying that he may not know the moves, but he can say, trust in my word because I'm going to win the game in the end. Yep. And yep. so therefore it, you can trust me, stick well, with me. God doesn't have to fully foreknow the future. He knows what his plans are. He knows all the possibilities and he knows that what, given whatever possibilities occur, he has the resources and ability to meet it and overcome it to still realize his purposes. And so I see that's what is happening all the time in scripture and in my own life, you know, anecdotally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I suggest we all see those kind of things. And, and so there's a lot of contingency in the world. We're making choices as we go. And sometimes we expect plan A and plan A starts to occur and then things happen. The bottom line, I think, is that if we're truly free, it can't already be in the cards. It can't already be set up before we make the choice. Because if it is set up before we make the choice, then there's a reality that exists already before we make our choice that would be inconsistent with our choosing anything else. Which means I have one option open to me, and that's not free. it's not free choice if that's the case. And so I suggest that the very notion of free will entails the, the you know, open alternatives. Now, there are people who redefine free will, meaning it's exactly what Calvin did. He redefined free will so that free will is doing whatever you desire to do. And your desires cause your what you're going to do, and you have no control over your desires. The problem with that is that you do have control over your desires, and what you do is not just the result of your desires. If it were, I suspect, I suspect that we would spend a lot more time copulating them. So, <laughs> yeah, no, and and I think that's where, uh, but but I mean, they would argue that God takes over your desires, and that's the reason that you do the good things that you do is because you've been regenerated, and and now He controls your desires, and you don't. Well, I can, what I can do is hand my will over to God's will, <coughs> and say, you know, when I say Thy will be done, I, I really mean that, and sometimes God says. No, this is up to you. My will is that you choose. My will is that you create. I, I made you a creator and a co-creator of the world with me. Well, and I, I found this, I, I always found this very interesting too. In a timeless sort of existence, is creation really possible? Because creation, the act of creation is a 
time, it's a temporal sort of, it's bounded within time. It's cause and effect. And so to be creative, time is a necessary ingredient to the, the, the creative sort of process. I think that's a good argument. I believe that the notion of creation is an inherently temporal um, notion that requires a before and an after. Yeah. And Can I ask this question? Oh, yeah. Jeff, I was going to ask with this idea, and I'm, and I'm not advocating for a lack of agency or, or determinism. At least I don't think I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Is it fair to say that your view of God's foreknowledge allows for man to frustrate because you, you keep saying he will win the chess game which i can understand in a chess game but in the plan of salvation there's a lot more moving pieces and i'm not saying he doesn't know all the moving pieces he doesn't know all the strategies but let's say for example right you would agree that um jesus christ had the choice whether or not to atone right of course so jesus christ could have thwarted or frustrated the plan of god yeah, everything hung in the balance. Here's the whole point. It really was all on the line. It truly could have failed. It depended on the best that God had. He didn't just send anybody. He didn't, he didn't send in the third string quarterback and hope he was going to make the pass. Nor did he send in the first string quarterback. He sent in Superman. Mm -hmm. Great arm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the bottom line is God sent the most amazing among us to do and accept. So he says, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will, which means he mm -hmm. had, he had you, for me. I remember when I first heard that concept, I actually heard it in the MTC, I had a great MTC teacher and he was teaching us about the atonement. And he said, he said, look, do you all realize he could have not done it? Everything was on the line. It wasn't predetermined. All of eternity hung in the balance when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. All of creation was like rooting for him at that moment, and he did it. And that's the reason that it's a celebration is because it could have been otherwise, but it wasn't, and it's the greatest celebration that we could ever imagine. Let's assume it couldn't have been otherwise. He was guaranteed to, to pull through no matter what. What praise is due to him then? Yeah. I submit none. Because what he did was inevitable. It couldn't be avoided. It was just had to happen. So how does, that, how does that work? Do you believe the atonement is timeless? I, I don't know what that even means, to be honest with you. I believe like, that the the, were the effects of the atonement um, accessible before the atonement happened? Yeah, the effects of the atonement were accessible, but I have an entire theory of atonement. For me, the atonement is... God seeks to be at one with us. The very nature of the relationship God seeks with us is atonement, and Christ's entire life was atonement. Okay, not just the moment in Gethsemane, not the moment on the cross. His entire life is an act of atonement. It's it's becoming one with us in our humanity, being what we are. And so, and with the atone with the actual Garden of Gethsemane and the cross being the ultimate oneness with us as it were as he entered into the depths of human suffering yeah, so at the beginning so christ is in the garden and he gives the high priestly prayer and he says father essentially return the glory that i had with thee before the world was restore it to me and at the ending of the prayer he thanks him for having restored the glory that he had with him before the world was something momentous happened Christ fully restored the nature of the relationship of that unity that he had with the Father while he was in Gethsemane. Hmm. And so what we're looking at is this incredible reality that atonement is doing that just that. It's entering into this relationship of unity with the Father. And in my theory of the atonement, I call it the compassion theory, Christ actually in the here and now enters into a relationship with us and feels our pain here and now when he does so. This The atonement is an ongoing reality. He's uh, still suffering. He's well, Yeah, he still suffers in a sense because we're painful to be in relationship with. Interesting. Because we, well, I guess you'd have to say to some extent that has to be true. We believe in a God who weeps, and we believe in a God who who's sad that we're sad and that cares about us. And so entering into a relationship with us 
who are pieces of crap in a lot of ways, like that's got to be painful to some extent. Otherwise, so, the same yeah. sense that he did in the garden, though, yeah. he's not bleeding from every pore. No, he's not bleeding from every pore, but the atonement is ongoing in the sense that he continues to share in our pain. He also continues to share in our and rejoice in our triumphs. And you asked if God's plan could be frustrated. The answer is that his overall plan where his kingdom will prevail and come is not going to be frustrated. But he loses all kinds of pieces along the way. Can you frustrate God's plan for you? Absolutely. You might, there's a possibility, and it's a real possibility that you would be lost. There's a genuine possibility that you might choose to go against God. There's a possibility you could be one for whom we would say it's better that he had never been born. Those are possibilities. And it were better that you never be born, that God should have ensured that you weren't born, but here it is. And we can do that because we are free agents, but on the macro scale of all his purposes as kind of a macro thing, that all will go according to his plan because he has the power to make it happen. Is that sort yeah. of correct? In a sense, he's already accomplished that fully because given what he's accomplished, it's up to us to accept his offer of grace that he's giving to us. We can freely accept it or not. And he's done everything necessary for us to be able to be fully saved. And he's done everything necessary for us to be fully exalted if we learn to love each other as he loves us. I see. So I'm going Aiden, to I'm going I'm to just kind of a little warning here. We're down probably to the last maybe um, five minutes or so, but uh, I'll kind of give it to you to hit on some of these last things you want to get to. Yeah, I really, I really like this. I still need to look at the struggles of prophecy and also foreordination. One other question that just came to my mind is in Doctrine and Covenants, I think it's 138, where it's Joseph F. Smith, I think it is. It's so Joseph F. who has the vision and he sees, you know, the uh, the great noble ones and he, you know, he sees or, or he understands that his, his father, Hiram and Joseph and the others that they were reserved for this time. How do you, like, would you say Joseph Smith was foreordained to be the prophet of the restoration? And if so, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no question Joseph Smith was foreordained, but we have scriptures in our Doctrine and Covenants that talk about what, if Joseph Smith falls, he'll be replaced by another. It was mm -hmm. a possibility that Joseph Smith wouldn't prevail and went through. He could but if, <laughs> well, my, my point is not that he could have chosen, because I believe he could have chosen. My, my question is, in order to foreordain a prophet to be the dispensation header, you'd have to know that there was going to be an apostasy beforehand. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So how, how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, these kinds of large macro um, movements, I think can be predicted based upon existing human nature. Uh, and God can kind of allow it to happen by, by not, um, giving um, a prophet on the face of the earth at a given time. So could have God raised up a prophet in 1790 instead of 1820? Yeah, why not? The bottom line is, is that God had a plan, and Joseph Smith was the one that, that was foreordained. And again, he's not choosing just anyone. He knows, as you say, he knows who Joseph Smith is, and he's giving him a task, and he knows Joseph Smith better than we do. And Joseph Smith is either going to accept or he's not, but the likelihood he's going to accept is so high. But if it's not Joseph Smith, it'll be somebody else, just as the Doctrine and Covenant said. So back to the chess analogy, essentially God knows, hey, Joseph is very good at this particular thing. This is the way he normally plays the game. I know him from the preexistence, and I am foreordaining him for this particular role at this particular time. That doesn't determine the moves he's going to make. And it, he even says if he if he does make moves that I don't expect, well, I'll replace him. Yeah, and, and remember, there are some who are fore, foreordained who don't come through. Samson, you know, he was foreordained. <laughs> he was foreordained to be a great judge. He just didn't fulfill his foreordination. Mm. And, you know, there are more than a few examples in the scripture of people who are foreordained who failed. And so it's an open possibility for us. Look, this is an ongoing dynamic interaction that we have with God. None of us are guaranteed to make it. We don't believe in eternal security like Calvinists do. Once saved, always saved, and there's no chance that you could possibly fall. A lot of people believe you can't sin. I've never understood that view, but, <laughs> you know, I, I just 
I just think that's that is that's just a, a hellacious belief. It's a ridiculous belief in the end. Yeah, and 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 one thing uh, with that, but I, and I've noticed this 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 desire amongst Calvinists amongst a lot of people for epistemic certainty, especially here in in our tradition as well. And what I have actually found great peace in is giving that up. But there's sort of this idea, and I, I honestly wonder if it comes from sort of the classical theistic tradition, where there's this idea that if you have God, you and you, it's like you have something solid, like the Bible, what the Bible says, man, that's the word of God. It's totally solid. It's it's the infallible truth, right? Or God made a prophecy. It's the infallible truth. It couldn't be otherwise. And what I have found is that that actually is uh, that that you can't have that in a world with agency. In a world with agency, you can't have perfect certainty. In a, in a world of entropy, you can't have perfect certainty. In a world of the physics that we understand, you can't have perfect certainty. And so there's sort of this, this problem with if you want something to be totally certain, like God made this promise, therefore it has to happen. It, in my mind, it, it like that destroys agency and isn't compatible with it. Yeah, and and there are some times when God would overwrite agency. I mean, there are a lot of occasions where if, if I were in charge, I would overwrite agency because I think it's less valuable than what I would achieve by overwriting it. I did it almost every night with my kids. They didn't want to go to bed, and I'd pick them up and take them up to bed. I overrode their agency. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, I believe in agency, but only to the point where, I, you know, I want some peace and quiet in the house. So, um, Can I ask? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask, I was going to ask another question that maybe this is missing the mark, but I think it does have some implications that apply here. Do you have any stance on whether or not our spirit bodies look like our physical bodies? I don't believe they can be isomorphic. Isomorphic means that they look exactly in every respect because <clears throat> I don't believe spirits age and look at me. I mean, you know, <laughs> Our, 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 our physical bodies do change. I'm losing all my hair on this one. Well, so, but what, did I look like a human? Do you have any stance on, on that? Did I, was I, did I, you know, was I black, you know, or was I middle Eastern, you know, or did I have a race? Does race exist in, in the spirits? I, I think a, a spirit body is a body where that would be more analogically compared to kind of a, a, an energy form, if you will. Okay, you know, so it, yes, it can it can take that form. the The bottom line is, <clears throat> when people see spirits, they see that they have a form. Many near death experiences, people see that they still have a form of a body, but it's very different. And so, for instance, you've got a person who's born without legs. You think their spirit lacks legs? I mean, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of reasons to believe that it's. Our spirits are not isomorphic with, isomorphic with whatever our body presently is, but there is some um, form and reality to a spirit body. So, yes, I believe there's such a thing as a spirit body. Um, and I'm kind of hoping that my, my wife's spirit looks exactly like she does. <laughs> I mean, she's a babe. I'm just telling you. So This, guy, this guy's fishing fishing for, for, for points. Hey, hey uh, I'll, I'll let you have a, a kind of the final word here, but I think uh, I think it's about time to wrap it up. Just to follow, follow through that thought, you maybe saw where I was going. If our spirits look like us in, in any at any age or however you want to put it, then that would mean that our parents would have been determined, right? That that because I, you know, genetically, I look like this because of my parents. So if my spirit looked like that, then were they not destined, if you will, to have me? So anyway, but if you don't believe that we have, you know, that I was this race and that I had this hair color or whatever in the preexistence, then that really doesn't work. I'm pretty sure that nobody in heaven is Middle Eastern or Caucasian or or black or that kind of thing. In the pre-existence and post-mortal. Yeah, I mean, those are kind of things that exist because of our our mortality in this world and so how does one say until you have personal um, experiences in this respect you're not really going to understand i'll just leave it there <laughs> sounds anyway, good to me. 
conversation. And thank you. This is uh, helping me to think about some things and hopefully our viewers as well. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, I didn't mean to be overbearing. It's just the way I am. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> not at all. I enjoyed it. Like you're, you're great. I greatly enjoyed it. Well, well, thank you very much for uh, for coming on, Blake, and for having this conversation with us. It's it's honestly been fantastic. Um, if anybody wants to uh, get your content or, or 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 connect with you in any way or see what you're up to, is there anywhere they can find that? I have a web page, blakeosler.com, where a lot of what I've written is available, <laughs> and um, I have the podcasts that are available online. Um, and I, I'm a, an attorney, and so I'm reachable through my law office. I let my secretary take calls, and she screens them. I found that to be a very useful tool, tool for avoiding people that, how do I say this? I, I want to be perfectly Christian. I just don't want to deal with them. <laughs> I was going to say, now I understand why I couldn't get through to you. Now, now, now it comes up. Now I understand. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, Blake. It's been a real pleasure uh, and uh, hope everyone has a good evening. Take care. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want more content, including the podcast, go to thoughtful-faith.com. Thanks for watching.